Howdy, everybody. Sit down last. Thank you for coming to this distinguished panel and me. Uh, we have, uh, oh, I don't have my notes with me. Perfect. So uh, I don't know who these Bill. people are without my notes. Bill. 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 Uh, actually, in order on my left, we have Lawrence Krauss, a cosmologist at Arizona State University, writer of Quantum Man, a book about Richard Feynman. One of my favorite people on this entire planet, and you know, as an astronomer, I know exactly what that means. Pamela Gay, an astronomer who does Astronomy Cast, also known as Star Strider. Another old friend of mine, Neil deGrasse Tyson. I don't think I need to introduce him very much. I love Neil. I love you. I love you. A, A, you know who he is, and, and B, he's given the talk after this, so I'll let George introduce him uh, more officially. And you know him as the science guy. I know him as Speedwalker from Almost Live. For those of you, the five of you laughing, awesome. Heel toe, heel toe. Executive Director of the Planetary Society, Bill Nye. We're going to be talking about the future of space, and I do want to mention that I'm actually quite pleased to be moderating uh, a very diverse panel. And in fact, the diversity should be very obvious to you all because two of these people have been on Stargate Atlantis and two of them have not. <laughs> um, so it's a pretty, pretty fair split with that. Um, sadly, right. uh, doctors McKay and Keller couldn't be here. They have a previous engagement in an alternate reality. For the, yeah, okay, so I'm trying to see the Almost Live fans and the Stargate Atlantis fans, okay. See who else I can alienate here. Literally, um, uh, the other day on Google, I got an alert uh, that uh, evidently Bill Nye and I are both employed by the NSA and the C uh, CIA. And, you know, we can split that. If you want NSA, I'll take CIA. It's a living. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> yeah, those, those checks, they keep, they keep rolling in between Big Pharma and NSA. It's awesome. Um, now, for those of you here, uh, there aren't too many of you here, I don't think, who have been to all of the TAMs, or at least TAM 1, which was in Florida in 2003. And I was thinking about this the other day. Uh, the TAMs last three days, roughly, three and a half days, which is 1% of the length of a year. And there are maybe four or five uh, extraordinary astronomical or space events that happen per year. So the odds of any one TAM hitting a specific astronomical event seems rather low. And yet, at the first TAM, uh, literally during the TAM, we lost Columbia. Columbia broke up in February 2003, and that happened during TAM 1. Uh, during another TAM, the Huygens probe from Cassini landed on Titan, the moon of Saturn, and returned pictures. And I remember scrambling to try to get those pictures displayed so that we could all see them, and we saw them right here at TAM. Uh, today, we are dealing with the last of the space shuttle flights. That picture is, in fact, right side up if you're on the space station. Um, and uh, that is an unusual event, and that this this it's is in the, orbit. There is no right side up. That's right. Um, <laughs> Near Earth, there might be. You just, know, he's just to clarify. Yeah, you, you look you look better that way, Neil. That's good. Okay. Um, there still is a down, though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And and well. <laughs> That is, that's an excellent point. There is a down, and, and Atlantis is going to land on Earth on July 21st, the 42nd anniversary to the day, depending on your time zone, that Neil Armstrong set foot on another world. Um, and I will say, in the, in the midst of this, we have another astronomical first, in that the Dawn mission is, orbiting, is going to be orbiting the asteroid Vesta sometime today. This is a main belt asteroid, the second largest. It's going to orbit for a year, take close-up pictures. This was taken about a week ago. And uh, it's in a week, in, in a year after a mapping mission, it's going to move on to Ceres, the largest of the main belt asteroids. Uh, I shouldn't be lecturing about this. I'm sure Bill knows more about it as the executive director of Planetary Society. Um, and you can also follow Emily Lakdawalla, who blogs for the Planetary Society, and she's a fantastic science writer. But with all of these events happening now, and seem to be happening with TAM, it seems wholly appropriate, especially with this uh, a really amazing uh, panel to talk about the future of spaceflight, the future of, of, of humanity in space, if not uh, our direct presence, at least our proxies in space by robots. And I have been hearing over and over again, and I mentioned this to Bill earlier, uh, that people are calling this the end of uh, human spaceflight, or at least the end of the space program, that NASA is uh, gonna land the shuttle, 
We don't have a, a rocket system in place. Con Constellation, which was going to replace the shuttle, was uh, scaled back and then eventually canceled. And we don't have anything going up in the future. And I actually want to keep this a little bit general and just uh, feel you guys out and get your impressions about this. I uh, think it's far more sad that uh, the James Webb Space Telescope is going to be canceled because that involves um, real science and not spending money to orbit 90, 100 pound tanks of water around the Earth. And uh, he means us. And uh, the James, and so if it is really canceled, there'll be no. That's the flagship of U.S. Astronomy for the next 20 years, and it'll be like uh, the cancellation of the superconducting super collider 20 years ago killed exactly. particle physics in this country. That's exactly, it'll right. be the, it, it's a disaster, and so people should write your Congress people and tell them not to cancel the James Webb Space Telescope. Is is anyone here not familiar with this? So James Webb Space Telescope. James Webb was the administrator of NASA under Kennedy, so he had a lot to do with the Apollo program and what many people Just think. Just like of. in NASA, when you're called administrator. You are the highest ranking That's person. That's the biggest the deal. Yeah. That's the biggest deal. It's not uh, Bill Nye's administrative assistant, yeah. which is a big deal. I mean, <laughs> but it's, yeah, it's the head person. So the, um, in the case of the superconducting super collider, for those of you who don't remember, by the way, these are all United States things you're talking about. If yeah. you want to go to the International Space Station, you take a Russian rocket. They're, they're fine. They work great. So I use rocket. It's, a, it's not cheap but it's considerably less than taking a U.S. space shuttle. Uh, right now, a little over a billion a flight. Billion dollars. A fl it's like a, that's not a good bargain. It's only right? 20 million if you're a U.S. millionaire and you want to go to Yeah, Russia. well, then it's, not, it's nothing to it. No, but so the thing is, the superconducting supercollider, the physicists, if I may, God particle love them. <laughs> Astrophysicist <laughs> went to went to Congress and said they were going to find my recollection. They're going to find the Z particle or the uh, Higgs particle, Higgs boson, yeah. right? And Congress people looked at them. Uh, well, that's fine for you guys, but we have uh, wars to conduct and, and people to feed and so on. Instead of saying we are going to unlock the next secret of the universe, yeah. that would have been a little more compelling. Similarly, James Webb Space Telescope, everybody, think of how much we love Hubble. We love images from Hubble and how it has changed the world. And when Hubble went way over budget, people wrung their hands, wanted to deorbit it. That's a verb. Uh, <laughs> but then it, uh, when it turned out the mirror was made improperly, but then people made derangements to fix the mirror. Okay. Same thing is going with James Webb Space Telescope. It's not the telescope that's the problem. It's management that's the problem. And so the universe isn't just expanding, it's accelerating, right? And you know why? Um, no, and- Nobody knows why. Yeah. <laughs> and so uh, if you want to find out, you have to build missions like this. I, I always like to say that no one knows, knows why, and if, if someone tells you that they know why, they're lying, especially if they're a string theorist. Yes. Oh. Okay. So- Do you know any? <laughs> One of the important things that NASA experimentally determined during the process of writing their most recent decadal survey is one should not allow planetary scientists or astrophysicists to budget anything because we don't include contingencies and we underestimate and we screw up. And, and this was actually, they, they did something really awesome with a recent survey of the community where they asked the planetary science community to say, what should we do for the next 10 years? And by the way, confine all of your dreaming to projected presiden presidential budgets so this is a realistic dream you're coming up with. And the planetary scientists and the geophysicists and the astronomers went off and locked themselves in rooms and came up with really awesome plans and really, they thought, realistic budgets. And then NASA did something for the first time that was very wise. They sent all of the budgets out to commercial agencies to look over and check for realism, and they came back about 30% higher. Now, with the James Webb Space Telescope, this is a mission that I believe was originally budgeted under $2 billion. It was $900 there, million okay. originally. Yeah. Then it got bumped up to about 1.5, and they're now estimating that it's going to come out at $6.5 billion because they let astronomers budget it and we shouldn't be allowed to. And, and Congress is looking at this and going, well, you guys clearly don't expletive know what you're doing. And, and rather than looking at us and going, wow, you guys know how to do science, we ask you to do something you're not trained for. 
they're trying to take away our toys. And the other problem is Congress is trying to get rid of two to four trillion dollars of US budget. And any of you who've ever written a budget before know that when you realize you're over, the first thing you do, which is stupid, but the first thing you do is just get rid of all the small line items. And you realize they don't add up to enough, but that's still the first thing you do. Every time I write a grant, the first thing I do is get rid of postage. And yeah, that's $200 and I'm 300,000 over. So you're the one. I, I, I am that one. But I write citizen science projects, so we'll get these people looking at the Don mission data he's talking about. So I want my postage back. <laughs> so human spaceflight is, is uh, very expensive. And there's long history of this, but let me just remind everybody, whether you live in the US or not, the uh, reckoned in 2010 dollars. Like how many people have used the expression uh, if they can put a man on the moon, why can't they blank? Well, in 2010 dollars, Apollo cost uh, 100, uh, rather 151 billion, 151 billion. The interstate highway system, which is quite large and is used a lot more uh, than by 12 people, uh, <laughs> cost 100, and by the federal portion, 114 billion. So it, there will never, I, I don't think there'll ever be another investment in space exploration at that level, because it was really a result of the Cold War. That's why people went to the moon. And, but on the other hand, everybody's pretty satisfied that if you can get a, a human into a situation to explore things, the human does things very well, is sort of the best explorer you can get. For, and, for now, I'm, I, I just well, in, a, in a matter of Years, that won't be true, I don't think. So. Mar Mars Phoenix, Curiosity. Hey, I'm a huge fan. Hey, I got the sundials. <laughs> I mean, I'm crazy for Mars, yeah. But, 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 but the geology, I mean, I don't want to say, the, the other thing is, bear in mind, I mean, I'm from the U.S., I grew up in the U.S., if it's U.S. versus anybody and whatever, speedball, uh -huh. I'm, you know, or uh, hockey, I'm generally U.S., but uh, Russian, the Soviet Union put the first cameras on the moon, the first soft landing on the moon, the first sample return, the first Mars rocks came back from the moon, all robotically. No. Mars rocks from the moon. Uh, Mars rocks from the moon. Bill, dude, <laughs> it's on my mind. You're, You're not supposed mind. to tell anybody. The first, the first rocks. <laughs> yeah. See, it's, that's the kind of slip where you lose that CIA gig. That's right. Oh, yeah, exactly. Uh, it was, all, it was all done by Hollywood anyway. So, yeah, so I apologize. The, uh, the first sample return from another world was done robotically by the former Soviet Union, but people didn't really get excited about it, and the Cold War didn't get resolved yeah. until humans were there. But, so but there's something to that. We're, we're about to move into a new age where we have SpaceX, which is led by Elon Musk, who did PayPal, and Tesla, mm -hmm. who's the most amazing young South African. He's about Can my age too. and has, like, already had three major corporations. It's, he's the most inspirational person that I've ever encountered. And I have no clue what was said, but all right. Um, <laughs> as, as we move into the future, we're going to be moving into a future where instead of having NASA running the show, we're going to have the commercial agencies launching as well. We're going to have the Mojave Spaceport, Spaceport America in New Mexico. We're going to have Virgin Galactic joining Virgin Atlantic as a way to spend your tourism dollars, if yeah. you're stupidly rich. <laughs> but, you know, but the problem is, I think that's all a scam. I, I really do. I think I just got asked about this. I, the point is that it's exponentially, look, to go in Earth or near Earth orbit, you know, to go the distance between New York and Washington above the Earth, yeah, maybe, Maybe private industry can do it, but it's just exponent. The laws of physics say it's just exponentially more expensive and exponentially more difficult to actually explore somewhere interesting. Yeah. And uh, well, 20, and, and right? therefore, I don't think it's ever going to be. I don't think private industry has ever got the, well, the, the commercial wait, 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 payback wait, wait. Is, is is not going to be in the near term God, without the team. government. I've been politely silent, haven't I? I know. I was yeah, really. Okay. I was. I was surprised. I was going to use the word oddly, but okay. Uh, <laughs> I didn't think you were that polite, though. But it's okay. I just want to clarify some of this information that's being bandied back and forth. There is fundamentally no business case yeah. for private. Can, can I finish the sentence? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure I want to be here anymore. <laughs> <laughs> there is fundamentally no business case for private enterprise to advance a space frontier. 
it, when you advance a frontier, you are making mistakes that the capital markets choose not to value. You are, have to create patents to enable things that you don't know will work. Anytime you are the first person to do something on that scale, the history of human civilization has demonstrated that the only funding available to do that is via governments. Yeah. And so what then happens is the patents get issued, the government figures out how to do it, they make it sort of routine, but they're inefficient because it's the government. Then you cede it to private enterprise. Can you to give get us the, an example? Uh, sure. The Dutch East India Trading Company. They were not the agency that found America from Europe. That was Columbus, funded by Queen Isabella. There was Magellan, also funded by Spain. They laid the groundwork to find out where to go. Does the Earth have an edge or not? Is it something worth doing? Then behind them, the Dutch East India Trading Company came to conduct business in a way safer than could have possibly have been economically justified had they been the first to do it. You look at the railroads that crossed the United States. Um, Newt Gingrich mentioned that as entrepreneurs leading the way, but he neglected the fact that Lewis and Clark got there first on a major funded expedition under the Jefferson administration. So you lay out the land, you map the rivers, you map the terrain, then you've got an understanding of what the risks are for the capital markets to then value, then they come in behind. So I see any participation of the private enterprise in space exploration, not the first ones to go to Mars, not even to go back to the moon, but to make our access to low Earth orbit the efficiently costed exercise that it really should have been at the beginning of the shuttle but was never realized. And, yeah. and that is what they're doing. Yeah, but, so but, uh, for but example, why do we want people in low Earth orbit? I mean, I just don't understand. Okay. Why, why do we want people hanging oh, out in low Earth orbit? Well, that, because they'll, they'll buy seats to take a vacation there. Well, uh, they already uh, have. <laughs> the people doing it, the people buying tickets at $20 million <laughs> yeah, a seat. A, uh, so you make it $10 million, more people will buy the seat. Yeah, make yeah, it a million dollars, even more. Yeah, absolutely, you're right. I think it's for entertainment purposes. So then purposes. what are you arguing with me about? Well, the point is, <laughs> as a goal, as a national goal, what do you want, why do you want people in low Earth orbit other than no, entertainment? No, if it's oh, commercial, it's there's goal. no national goal. If it's commercial, it's whatever makes yeah. money. Yeah, I, no, no. I but want them there goal. because it will lower the cost of getting satellites for research into orbit. Thank you. No, no. And, well, why would it do that? And, <laughs> and, 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 <laughs> Is there more? If NASA needs to go back to the space station, they don't have to launch one of their own rockets. Yeah. They hitch a ride on Elon Musk. But hopefully rocket. we can get rid of the space station so they won't have to go there. Whatever well, they will need, whatever is the need in low Earth orbit, NASA should not be the truck driver to yeah, make that happen. I agree with you completely. No, so... Uh, As I always do. So how do you... The, the analogy is Antarctica for me. Like, you maintain a scientific presence in Antarctica. You have people there. They think deep thoughts. They, uh, I remember very well cleaning bicycle chains with a uh, chlorinated fluorocarbon a carburetor cleaner. Can't buy that anymore because people discovered that it was hard on the ozone. Yeah. So uh, you may, So you, you killed the ozone. Yes, mm -hmm. I was the guy. Mm -hmm. So if you uh, you maintain a presence in Antarctica and you maintain a presence in Earth orbit, if there's scientific things to do there. But the whole thing, everybody, is you want to explore space at a reasonable cost. This is something you do as an intellectual. Uh, intellectually sophisticated society with treasure, with money, with means. You explore Lewis and Clark, explored the continent, you explore space, you explore deep space, because you don't really know what you're going to find. And I remind everybody that relativity was discovered barely a century ago, and yet everybody in this room got here on account of our understanding of relativity. I mean, you had your car <laughs> navigation system, and you're, many of you were on an airplane. And uh, those are driven now by information from space. If you told my grandfather there'd be signals from space that you have to take into account both the gravity of the Earth and the speed of the spacecraft, he'd think you were nuts. But yet here we all are. And so there is a whole nother physics, yes? Right there. Just It's so close uh, that when we discover it, who knows? And this is what, uh, I grew up in the US, I mentioned that, but. What I've tried to do now, I wrote this op-ed, just remind people in the U.S. Congress and Senate that if you don't want to discover what makes the universe accelerate, maybe somebody in another country, maybe and, and somebody from China. But, but you agree with we'll me that those discoveries won't be made by humans 
orbiting 200 miles above the Earth. They'll be right. made by oh, wonderful yeah. spacecraft that are designed efficient. Designed by they, humans. Yeah. yeah, but designed by humans that yeah. actually, you know, are cost effective. You, yeah. you said the key point. I mean, the difference between Antarctica and the International Space Station is, I don't know what the but NSF, Neil probably knows what the NSF budget is for Antarctica. It's probably can't talk less than 50 million a year. I don't know. But, but the space station is a $100 billion oh, tin can sitting up there doing absolutely nothing. Well, so here's what would be really good use of it, uh, is to get Taikonauts on board. That, that's Chinese astronauts? Chinese space flyers would be fantastic. Because uh, another Cold War or even the beginning of a Cold War is very, very expensive undertaking. Well, and, and anything and we do to defuse it would be good. Th that's actually one of the, the big problems that we're dealing with right now in terms of trying to um, make science in space something that's achievable. Because most nations in the world are dealing with economic crises right now. And China is doing quite well, and they're planning their own space agency. They have their own space agency. They've launched their own men into space. They're in the process of planning their own independent space station that's theirs. And if we could just partner with because them Because we denied their access to our space station, True. citing human rights violations. As a result, they said, we still want to go to space. We'll do it without you. And they built their own space program, and became the third spacefaring nation to put a human being into orbit, and their ambitions remain high. And, yeah. and this year they tested number one in science and technology. So can we tick you <laughs> off, Neil? <laughs> you know, I'll tell you, if I may, can we get questions from the audience? Because we I was, can stand here and I was going to go go there in just a minute, yeah. actually. And by the way, Neil, when you do that, you're supposed to go. Yeah. Like that, yeah. because that's that's the throwdown. But I, I, I want to point out um, that that the governments are actually partnering with yeah. private space well, agencies. That's, of course, Elon there's Musk the and yeah. those guys are benefiting from right. A, a so good SpaceX idea. has actually gotten something yeah. like 500 million yeah, dollars sure. from yeah. NASA. And full disclosure, Elon Musk is on the board of the planetary site. So. And, and the, the, the their new uh, organization. Yeah, I'm not affiliated. <laughs> I just think he's awesome. <laughs> I'm just a big fan of SpaceX, yeah. and yeah, they're building too. their their heavy lift rocket, which is going to be capable of 50 tons to orbit at uh, what he's planning is a, t a tenth of the cost of the space shuttle. Uh, uh, that's, that's probably right. Yeah, that's so. And, and the company that produces uh, electronic, uh, electric cars or that are, that are yeah. going to be all over California. The Tesla's which are, Tesla. Which, yeah, yeah, which are built in Boulder, by the way. Yeah. Uh, so they, um, <laughs> I, we went to the factory, SpaceX factory, and uh, looked at the engine. I gotta say, I'm a mechanical engineer. I mean, I'm human. <laughs> but, uh, you, yeah, really? I thought you were an engineer. Yeah, um. so. Uh, uh, these things are very clean, and the reason is that you don't have to have tubes running everywhere to transmit pressures from one part of the engine to another. It's very nice. And we talked to Jeff Rakiki, who's the head engineer, I guess, of structures there, and he said, you know, we didn't reinvent this thing. We took the NASA documents and manuals yeah. and just read them. Yeah. So to your point, uh, the, all the patents and intellectual uh, achievements were done 40 years ago, and these guys are re-embracing it. So it's, it's good. And that's just one example. I mean, it's a good use. You know, lower, to get into space takes so much energy. To get into orbit takes about nine times as much energy. To get to what people like to call escape velocity is about twice that again. So it's, it's an old thing called the beer can problem. The amount of liquid in a typical beverage can compared to the mass or the weight of the can is about uh, what rocket fuel is to a rocket. Yeah. So you think about uh, you know, how much you could put in that little pull tab on the top, the little opener, how so, much so electronics. So it didn't have to be beer. It could just be Pepsi. I said yeah. beverage. <laughs> this, is, beverage. this is Tam. You said it's called the beer can yeah. problem. It's but called the beer can problem. And they said it's the weight of problem. the mass of the beverage. <laughs> This is that, a really important issue. taking it to a whole different This is a vitally round. important issue. But actually, but, but, the, but that's the reason, one of the reasons why I proposed a one-way trip to Mars. It's part of the reason is that coming back costs so much because you've got to send the fuel there to get them back. So it's much cheaper, much, much cheaper to send people one way. So are there volunteers? <laughs> because ne I have Neil? This, no, anyway. There's several people that I would uh, l like to send one way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it's... I th my understanding is that the qualifications are different. Yeah. <laughs> Just, Let's uh, see, uh, I, I need to bring Lawrence to a new place, if I may. Oh, wow. Is it, is it Mars? Okay. No, no. no, no. <laughs> I'm slightly scared. All right. uh, Lawrence, my distinguished colleague to my left, is uh, 
has a, uh, uh, let me say, party line position of the, of the scientific, much, many in the scientific community that the MAN program is largely just a waste of money, that you take that same money and for every chunk of money that you spent putting a human being wherever you were going to put them, you can send 100 unmanned probes. A thousand. To go, a thousand. It's yeah. probably, I, I, I somewhere between 100 and a thousand. Yeah, it's factor 10, we're astronomers, yeah. it's fine. Okay, <laughs> so that is surely true, and I have no argument with that, but, but it assumes, <laughs> but, yeah. It assumes that NASA is your private science funding agency, but the history of NASA's funding profile has never betrayed that fact. If you look at the fraction of NASA's budget over its 53-year life that has given, been given unto science, it will average at about 22% of the total budget. It peaked in 2004 at 40%. The recent average has been about a third. It has like never been more flight. than a half. Human space flight the fraction of the total NASA budget given to science has oh, never been more, the average has been down in the mm -hmm. 20s percents. So what that says is NASA was never budgetarily driven by science motives. NASA from its conception, inception, sorry, yeah. inception. <laughs> oh, we don't know. We don't want to talk <laughs> about conception here. <laughs> NASA from its inception, as uh, Sir William to my right duly noted, was driven by Cold War politics. Let's be honest with ourselves about this. The very speech that we all remember and has resonates in our cranium, President Kennedy saying, we will put a man on the moon and return him safely to Earth. You can even hear his Brookline accent as he recites it in your memory. In Kennedy Space Center, Florida, there's a bust of Kennedy and chiseled in the granite in the main entrance are those words. There's a lot of other granite there with nothing chiseled into it. <laughs> what they could have done was put another sentence from that same speech, but they didn't. Here's a sentence from that speech. The, if the events of recent weeks, Yuri Gagarin had just come back out of orbit and we didn't yet, did not yet have a vehicle that could safely put a human being anywhere off the launch pad, he said, if the events of recent weeks are any indication of the impact of this adventure of the minds of men, then we need to show the world the path of freedom over the path of tyranny. That was the battle cry against communism. That was the war driver. That's what dislodged the hundred billion dollars from the American coffers to send us to the moon. Let us be honest with ourselves about that. The budget for NASA has always been historically driven by geopolitical forces. Given that fact, you, if you want to have the argument that it shouldn't be a geopolitical force, that's fine. But you cannot say, you cannot cry foul because it's not science. That's, that's apples and well, oranges. Well, let, me, let, me take, let me come to your place. Um, uh, the, uh, so first of all, you're absolutely right. It's the same, by the way, is true from the field I originate from, particle physics. The huge funding for particle physics was also a, a remnant of the Cold War, a remnant of the atomic bomb project, basically. The fact that, that big science was felt to be in the national interest of national security, even if it wasn't. And by the but, way, what year did the superconducting super collider, super collider get, get its funding reviewed and then cut? It was the years shortly after peace broke out exactly. in Europe. Yeah. Okay, but there were other reasons. That's they, when they cut. Uh, no, no, but, you can say that there are other reasons, but I <laughs> submit to you, I submit to you that there is no greater driver than the war driver. And that's why uh, every one of your particle accelerators was fully funded for the entire duration of the Cold yes, War. Yes, but let me, just so let me make the point clear, though. <laughs> oh, no, no. Um, but uh, l l that, that you're absolutely right that we shouldn't assume that everything is for science. What I think we should be assume is that we should just be a little honest. I, about a little over a decade ago, I actually testified for the House Committee with Buzz Aldrin on the future of space exploration. And my point is that I don't think human space travel is a waste. It's actually for adventure. I grew up staying home from school watching the Apollo landings. That excited me. I'm, you and We've all been on stage with astronauts, and we know how excited people are just to be near them. 
And so the point is, I just think we have to be honest. We say we send humans into space for adventure, and we do other things for science, and if we're honest about it, then the science budget won't somehow keep getting cut when there's cost overruns for, for the International Space Station or something like that. That's, but, that's my But the point. irony is we use the international arguments to rescue the funding in some cases. The International Space Station is basically the stinkiest thing on orbit from what I understand. It's, it's a men's locker room that occasionally has women in it. And, and the reason that this... Are you saying men smell worse than women? Yes. I'm saying men's okay. locker rooms <laughs> smell worse. <laughs> so how, the, do you, how do you know that? No, I'm just <laughs> We're not going there. I'm um, but, but one of the reasons that its funding was saved all the different times that it almost got canceled is because of the large number of international treaties that went into having the US launch all of the pieces for other nations that forked over funding and started building things. And at a certain point, you really don't want to piss off all of your allies by canceling their favorite These toy. These are just the simple geopolitical drivers. But, that, that, but the SSC got canceled. It was an international thing. The James Webb State Telescope is and, an international thing. And, we're and what I'm both. hoping is we can rescue James Webb, at, in part as we rescued Fermi. The, the Fermi mission, which Phil was part of, um, almost got canceled a number of times. And it was through phone calls, which actually severely ticked off the then NASA director to the point that he told all of the astronomers that we needed to sharpen up and behave or be sent to the, I kid you not, he said we'd be sent to the children's table next time we call all of our senators. I call all of your senators. Um, That's a quote. Pamela and I were in the audience when he said that. And, and we were sitting fairly, next to each other. Was it Mike Griffin or something? Uh, was it Griffin or it was, was it, uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah, sounds it was like Griffin. Griffin. Yeah. yeah, sounds like Griffin. Um, but, call him Mike. but the hope is... <laughs> We, we flew NASA instruments on the Chandrayaan mission that orbited the moon. We had Beagle was something that we weren't totally part of, but we were part of getting it there before it crashed and did nothing good. Um, they thought of it as an instrument more than a spacecraft. That's what they yeah, Cassini, Cassini and the Huygens probe, that was, again, an international collaboration. Over and over and over, the way we're accomplishing science is to have different nations build the things they're best at. Canada makes the best robotic arms in the world. <laughs> so to do science, we need to collaborate. And I have no idea why Canada just got wooted that much, but my husband's Canadian, so I thank you. The, can the Canadians Canadian. are moving further south in America, apparently. <laughs> With global warming? So you, uh, you want to take questions? The whole thing yeah, is we, have, we want to explore yeah. space at an economical cost because we don't know what we're going to discover. And the word explore is a great word because when you explore, no matter, kind of no matter what it is, you're going to make discoveries uh, and you're also going to have an adventure. Those two words are in the word explore. Mm -hmm. So the word explore is great, but it has been uh, at NASA, they have this thing called the Exploration Mission Directorate. Yeah. Uh, and that means human spaceflight. Yeah. Uh, instead of what you might think of it in the bigger picture, like a telescope or a microscope or what have you. So I, I'd like to take questions, you all. Yeah. I mean, we do yeah, have a few minutes. Out. I don't suppose anybody has real questions, right, for, the, for this group? And, and no? while someone's coming up to the mic, I realized I have to say, I have NASA funding. I am not speaking for NASA. Everything I say is strictly my own opinion. <laughs> Standard disclosure. I like my funding. <laughs> go ahead, George. Here we go. My boy, Kurt Vonnegut, once said that uh, when in writing, um, always put a human character in a setting if you want people to pay attention and be interested in it. And he said that people didn't pay any attention to the space program until we started sending human beings up there and human beings to the moon. So it may be far less sexy to send robots up there, but um, uh, my, my point here is... is sorry. Make sure that's your <laughs> okay. If, it were, if we were on a game show, yes, can yes. you state that in the form of a ex, question? Ex-JREF staff, um, Sean McCabe, everybody. I know. <laughs> anyway, um, so my point is, even if it's less rational and less practical, what if we need that sexiness factor of sending human beings up there to get people interested in space and funding space in the first place? Mars Phoenix. No, but, uh, it tweeted itself as a little person and was fallen in love with, and when it died, it, it was immortalized in Wired magazine by people who cried at the death of a Twitter feed that died with a robot. Uh, but, you know, I think... Wait, 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 that's delusional. Um, <laughs> I'll explain why. 
I agree. Okay, Neil, hold on, hold on. No, go ahead. I'll, I'll wait, speak wait, later. Wait, wait. <laughs> what? Allow me to explain. Okay. Okay. The reason why there's so much interest in that Twitter feed is because the manned program was not itself advancing an exploration frontier. Had they been doing that at the same time, no one would have given a rat's ass what the robot was doing. But, and that's, and that's the, what was implicitly recounted here with the moon. In the 1960s, there were robots on the moon. Did you hear about any of them? No, because the manned program was advancing a space frontier. If you do both simultaneously, we're gonna be listening to the tweets of the astronauts and not of your robot. Uh, that's how I, that happened. I, you know, Without I, the manned program, I, the robots look really sexy. I, I hate to agree with Neil at all, but... Um, <laughs> uh, Phoenix uh, but, was but, cute! No, no, but there's some sense to what he said in this case, but uh, the... the, the um, does anybody We're know friends. exactly when it no, lost control anyway, of this? No, but anyway, the point is, I think you're right. And the, man, the, the, the fascination with humans in space is, in my mind, is one simple thing. They can die. We all want to wait and see if they're going to die. And, and, and that's the only interest in it. We, we want to see if they're going to die. And, um, and that fascination is hard to match with a robot dying. Is no, I agree completely. But at the same time, one can create... I think when I... I mean, when you see, you know, the Huygens probe, for example, was brilliant in my mind. Put a microphone on it, and you can go to the webpage and listen to it land. And then pretty soon, with, with what we're going to be able to have with virtual reality and, and the ability to, to have images, you will be able to be on another planet with a robot and feel like you're there. And I think at that level, it's going to feel like we're there. But, but so I think it's very that, hard to compete with humans. There's no so doubt about on, it. So on that line, are we going to have the next TAM uh, by Skype? Please, Are people no. not going to come meet like this? <laughs> Are we going to do it all robotically? He shoots, he scores. <laughs> <laughs> my, my point is, if we didn't look, you know what? 20 if, years. If, 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 the, if the Randy Foundation was, weren't so wealthy and, and no people couldn't afford to put it on, we'd have it all by Skype if, if that was the only way we yeah. could do it. And, and at the end of the day, the thing is, manned space flight, kind of awesome, kind of wish I could be part of it. But there isn't the budget in the world right now to do it right. We want to learn, we want to explore, we want to do science, and we have to use robots to do that. Hold on. <laughs> I'm sorry, should I just calm down? <laughs> no, yeah. bring it on, Dr. T. Here's the closing. <laughs> Testify. Plus we got questions. <laughs> Tell the truth. I, and I want to make sure we get the questions, but I got to rebut gonna. that. Rebut that. Okay, uh, to say there's no budget in the world, the federal budget is three point something trillion dollars. Doesn't go as far as it used to. If you... <laughs> yeah, it used to be real money. If you want to count to a trillion, it would take you 100,000 years, and that's one number per second every waking and sleeping moment of your life. That's how big that number is, point one. Point two, it's not that we can't afford it, it's that we have chosen to not afford it. Mm -hmm. I tweeted recently... <laughs> I tweeted recently that the U.S. bailout of the banks exceeded the 50-year budget of NASA. Yeah. You want to put something in context, if you want to do something with three and a half trillion dollars, you can do whatever you want. The, what, whatever you judge to be important to the profile yeah. of the nation that you were trying to build and to sustain. So I submit to you that when you look at the NASA budget, and I'm tired of saying this, but I'll have to say it again. The NASA budget is four-tenths of one penny on a tax dollar. If I held up the tax dollar and I cut horizontally into it four-tenths of one percent of its width, it doesn't even get you into the ink. So I will not accept a statement that says we can't afford it. <laughs> I gotta say, that's Dr. T. And do the thing. When I, I, th I really do look at it differently. If you're gonna tell me I can cut uh, that much of a bill off, or right up to the ink, that's a lot of money. That's a, I mean, to me, if you gave me the budgets being slashed from 19 to 18.7 now to 16 point something, yeah. if you gave me $16.9 billion, I should be able to do something. Really, exactly. I should be able to get something done. But we have a legacy of these NASA centers all over the country that's left over from the Cold War, and that's got to be shaken out. It's, it's a long way to go. Let's but, it, but, in, but there's another, yeah, well, I mean, 
the, the James Webb Space I'm Telescope sorry. overrun is less than the cost of air conditioning in Afghanistan. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. I'm right there. No, I'm a huge fan of James Webb. I mean, bring it on. Le last week, I was talking with David McConville, who's the president of the Buckminster Fuller uh, Institute. Oh, yes. And he said that one of the elephants in the room around space travel, uh, in terms of tourism, space tourism, is the impact on global warming. Do any of you know anything about that? He said it was astronomical. I, I forget the figures. Is he talking about the carbon footprint? Yes, mostly, I think. Oh, well, yeah, no, it is kind of gross. Well, we'll cross that bridge, people. Uh, and c climate change, you know, is the biggest problem. And so when you look at the Earth from space, I submit you are going to make discoveries about climate change that you wouldn't make. But we're cutting the, looking at Earth oh, from space. That's the problem. The We've guy. also cut the missions that are going to look at Earth, Earth from space to, to probe climate change. What's the carbon footprint on a hydrogen oxygen fuel tank? <laughs> it's, uh, th th the fuel tank isn't the thing. It's hauling yeah. the fuel there, uh, cooling the... It, can, it, down. Yeah, um, it may be say, making the yeah. tank. Petroleum actually. products that maintain yeah. the refrigerator and all that stuff. And it, it's it's like your pumps. Prius is made of plastic, and that's a problem. Yeah. And they're solid rockets. But we got to get questions. Okay. And the solid <laughs> rockets. I have a very simple and slightly juvenile question for all five of you. Um, I just want to know what each of you think is like the next big thing that we should be doing. Like, there's a lot of people that say Mars, Earth-like planets, or robotic missions. What is each of your next big thing that you think we should be doing? You double NASA's budget and you do it all. Uh, it, the trouble so, is you won't do it all if you double the NASA budget. So uh, for me, there's two things. I want to know why the universe is accelerating. That's a big deal for me because I suspect it's the next relativity. It's the next classical physics. It's the next world changing and maybe even source of energy. Then the other uh, thing... No, no, it'll never... Sorry, sorry. Let me make that clear. You're it'll not sorry never about anything. <laughs> It won't, it won't be? Uh, except being here. No, anyway, um, no, it won't be. It can't be a source of energy. Please don't say that. You're going to encourage lots of crackpots. It is not a source of energy. It's the energy of empty space. If the energy of empty space could get any lower by working, then it wouldn't have energy. It's, it's not a source of energy. Please no, no. don't tell people. We will Mike, never Mike. break the sound barrier. Yeah, exactly. We will never. <laughs> no, uh, the energy of empty space is... Actually, I agree with Lawrence. Well, no, my time. claim is that by looking for this thing, you will make discoveries. That's my claim. Uh, then the other thing that I'd like to specifically do, I'd like to send the right instrument to some gully on Mars where there's an underground, under sand glacier oozing super salty water off the wall on a summer day and look for fossil Mars probes. Yeah. And stranger yet, crazier yet, something that's still alive. If we discovered life on another world, it would change this one in the same way Copernicus and Galileo and those guys change it. Now this is something you don't just throw a few trillion dollars at it, you work at it. Take a few decades. But that discovery or that uh, proof that there was no such thing, it would also be remarkable. And it, w it wouldn't be that expensive. Most of it could be done without humans. And, yeah, well, and humans would build the stuff. I got a but, feeling. Uh, <laughs> I, the, but I think the discovery of, life, of at least conditions for life elsewhere is something that is driving and probably one of the most interesting things. It doesn't, I, I agree, I think we, sh we need to go to, I would be amazed if we not, didn't find evidence of life on Mars and find it was our cousins because we pollute each other. And, and, and we've discovered that. Uh, the m objects go between the two planets, and, and certainly microbes can live long enough for that, for that short duration. Which but we, we'll also you, look at... You can't find Mars rocks on the moon, yeah, in yeah, fact. Yeah. 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 And you yeah. can find them on the Earth, <laughs> that's right. But, um, yeah, as we've just heard. But um, uh, the, 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 we also want to look for life elsewhere, and we'll be able to eventually be able to image planets and look for oxygen atmospheres, for example, which is there's, the oxygen on Earth only exists because of life. There was no free oxygen on Earth before life. So that would be a wonderful, wonderful probe. Uh, uh, as one of the people who helped discover dark ener the energy of empty space, I'm fascinated by it. But I actually think, unfortunately, that's going to be a m it's unlikely that we're going to learn much about that in the lifetime of anyone in this room experimentally. It's just a problem, and I could go into it, that's very, very, that's un there, it's, a, it's the most fundamental problem in science, in my opinion. But I think it's going to require a good idea before an experimental help. So I'll, we shouldn't inspire people to look for it. Yeah, probably. yeah, we should. Because it's impossible. Yeah. I'll add that JWST is, would go a long way yeah. towards figuring yeah, out dark just, energy. It's just cool. What? what? Yeah. JWST will go a long way towards... Uh, oh, it will down. not. It'll go a long way towards discovering the primordial black holes and the origin of structure in the universe. It's profoundly interesting, but I think it's unfair to say... I really worry about hyping things when I know 
they're not going to do what you say they're going to do. And I think JWST is plenty interesting without pretending it's going to tell us anything well, about dark energy. Hubble telescope did 100 times more than what anyone ever projected for. Exactly. But the stuff we didn't expect, not the stuff we did. Well, okay, so, let's, so why don't we... <laughs> well, now hang on. Okay, so you're saying lower our expectations for the things we expect and heighten our expectations for the things we can't figure out what to predict. JW, every time we open a new window on the universe, we are surprised. There and that's the go. reason yeah. That's the reason to open the new windows, because you shouldn't listen to theorists like me, uh, because... We figured we, that out because, earlier. Yeah. In, in the, <laughs> we, because... No, this is the big thing. Good one. Actually, that's your best line so far, Neil. So why, but, are, uh, you, why are you looking at this new, over this new horizon? What are you going to find? We don't know. We don't know. That's exactly. It's looking. a surprise. New Horizons yeah. is going to find the surface details of Pluto. Oh man, that's going to be, no, listen, I took the wheelbarrow full of uh, postcards to Mikulski's, the Senator Mikulski's office to keep the mission to Pluto going. You know, it's going to arrive in 2015. Yeah. So stay tuned. It will, it will be fabulous. Can I just give my favorite mission, which doesn't exist and isn't funded now, but it'd be yeah. really cool. Yes. It would be to go to Jupiter's moon Europa, yeah. Yeah. which has an icy yeah, outer agree. surface. The the gravitational stress on Europa from Jupiter and other surrounding moons is pumping energy into it, much the same way when you warm up a racquetball by hitting it. You distort it, it bounces back to shape, you're pumping energy into it. That has melted the interior ice. It has had an ocean of liquid water that's been liquid for billions of years. And every place on Earth we find liquid water, we have found life. I want to go ice fishing on Europa. <laughs> Put lower submersible, look around, and for me, the biggest question will be, what do you call that life? It'd have to be like Europeans, right? Because it's, <laughs> it's Europa. That's what I think. Europe, Europeans. Well, Let's I, get I, I think we should go a lightning yeah, one more. round here, yeah, where one more. only one of us can answer. Yeah, we have to okay. answer it quickly so we can get through everybody. How about you that? want to talk about dreaming an impossible dream. We're not, you know, <laughs> we're not going to get to everybody, but we're going to have one more, one more good one here. All right. Do you think the concept of a space elevator is possible, and if when? No. Next. No. <laughs> <laughs> quick, but bear quick. in mind that the space elevator is this thing that's so strong for its weight, you could just take an elevator into space. But once again, the political problems are going to be the hard thing. You know, if the thing yeah. comes loose and starts whipping around, <laughs> you know, and, uh, and then who's going to build and who's going to be responsible, the ultimate high ground and all that stuff. But uh, uh, well, you might use it to drill into the earth and drop a black hole. Okay, you know, next question. <laughs> one more here. Anyway, one more. Yeah, and here those materials will change I the world. I knew it. Manned interplanetary spacecraft, solid shields, or electromagnetic? Electromagnetic. Uh, you mean like solar sails? Nope. No, he means shielding shields. from the cosmic yeah, rays. Shielding problem. For oh, cosmic oh okay. rays. I'll go electromagnetic, yeah. I go not at all. <laughs> he goes for cancer. I, I okay. rarely have an opinion about hardware. <laughs> for real, last question. Here we go. Why don't we spend more time talking about the economic benefit of big government science, which is technology development, the spin-off of which has paid for the space program dozens of times over? I, I agree that, we, that, that every time we spend a lot of money, it, there are huge spin-offs. But one of the problems that I think about doing that, and the SSC had this problem, is we talked about all the spin-offs of doing particle physics, but we didn't do what, what Bill said you need to do, which is you can't justify a program by its spin-offs. You've got to say it's worth doing because it's worth doing. And if you start to justify it by the spin-offs, people are saying, start to say, well, what, you know, why are you doing it in the first place? So there's no doubt that when we spend any amount of money, we, we make technological breakthroughs. But I think you have to justify it for its own sake first. I would claim that if all you did was say, we're going to innovate technologically as one pathway towards economic growth, and the other pathway would be, we're going to Mars. Who's coming? And <laughs> Everybody who's the best student in their class chooses that as their profession rather than becoming investment bankers, then you're going to innovate. Yeah. One more. Yeah, one more. Oh, as, no, let's uh, get them all. as Phil could tell you, there are plenty of ways in which space can kill us and wipe out the Earth. Um, and so some people, in a more romantic state of mind, think of space, human spaceflight as a way of ensuring long time survival of the species. Is that at all a part of these discussions at this time? Is this more just um, you know, an individual um, driver for people? Well, you look at the cover of the TAM-9 uh, brochure, what do we call it, uh, uh, episode program. guide. Yeah, program. It's uh, this whimsical thing about the future, but terraforming Mars is not as easy as it looks. 
But it, but it is, I think we, I bet we'd all agree though, at some point in the long term future, the future of humanity is in space. It's a part of, we want to diversify, we're all in a one shot thing here on Earth. And so I have no problem no, with ultimately delusional. colonizing well, other it, systems. It's delusional, it, it, I'll tell you why. Shh, shh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> This crops up in a different way. There's a, mission, there's a telescope called the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope. 10 meter telescope designed to survey the sky once every three nights from the southern hemisphere. One of the it's major not going ways. <laughs> One of the major justifications for its funding is it could find that killer asteroid and give us years, and I know this because I narrated the NSF video they're showing. Um, yeah. It'll give us a couple years chance to figure out how to get that sucker somewhere else other than killing us. And so we can justify prolong justify science by saying we're going to prolong human beings by protecting our own planet with the LSST in this case. So the you only can fund science by saving humans. The only preventable natural disaster yeah, is the uh, near-Earth object yeah. getting too but near. But I have to rebut Larry here. <laughs> Lawrence. Lawrence. Yeah, thank you. Lawrence. Uh, Neil, make it short because our keynote speaker is a real diva. So okay. <laughs> I don't want to eat into his time. I don't want to eat into his time because okay. you know what he's like. So real it, short. Here we go. It's, it's real short. <laughs> I'm guessing, Lawrence. Maybe I'm wrong, but I'm just guessing that Whatever it takes to terraform Mars and move a billion people there so that we're a multi-planet species so that one planet does not go extinct from an asteroid, whatever effort that is, that's probably more than what it takes to deflect an asteroid. Uh, I agree with you there, absolutely. I agree with you there. But we I do agree. I, but I actually um, so, so so the notion let's live in twenty two planets so we're protected. Oh no, that's no, I, I don't mean it for protected. I think we'll eventually we will eventually colonize other systems. I think but you said it to protect the species, and that's oh, oh, okay, well, fine, fine. Well, we only need to move two people to Mars, then. Yeah. I, yeah. I read that in a book. Adam it's and really Eve. fertile people. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, by the way, well, I won't tell you. No, 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 no. Uh, we're actually, uh, we are out of time. Um, this has been an interesting panel. I, I, uh, <laughs> I probably should have participated in some way, but there you go. Let's thank our speakers. We have Bill Nye, Neil Tyson, Pamela Gay, and Lawrence Krauss. Thank you. And Phil Plate, our moderator. The Planetary Society will have a table tomorrow. Thanks. That was good. That was good.